Whispering. Whispering Streets. The whispering streets of the heart are the arteries that pump the blood into it and hurry the blood out of it. But I like to think that the heart's real whispering streets are the ones that project human kindness and give out tenderness. The superintendent of nurses in a big hospital has need of tenderness and human kindness, even when she's away from the hospital. As Anna Callahan stood in front of her apartment door, fitted a key into the lock, she was preoccupied. She scarcely heard the door across the hall opening. She started violently when a voice spoke her name. Good evening, Miss Callahan. Oh, uh, good evening, Mr. Borden. I heard you coming along the hall. Thought it might be the boy with the evening paper. You uh, look tired, Miss Callahan. I, I am tired. Come into my apartment. I'll fix you a cup of coffee. No, I, I wouldn't be good company. I, I have too much on my mind tonight. If you feel strange about drinking coffee in a man's apartment, just say so. Well, in, in a way, I do. All right. Then we'll leave the door open. That'll placate Mrs. Grundy. This is the seventh time I've invited you for a cup of coffee, Miss Callahan. I'll catch you off guard yet. Or maybe someday you'll invite me to your apartment. Perhaps someday I will. Good night, Mr. Borden. Reed Borden stood staring at his neighbor's tightly shut door with a rueful smile on his mouth. After a moment, he shrugged and closed his own door. If he muttered something about women who were too darned absorbed in their jobs, you can't blame him. But this evening, Anna's mind was occupied with someone who was a part of, and yet apart from, her job. Just an hour ago, she pushed open the door of a hospital room. John? How are we today? All right, I guess, Miss Callahan. Oh, you look fine. You'll be sitting up before long. I'm... I'm trying hard to sit up. Oh, that's why you're making progress. Well, shall we gab for a while? You bet. Hmm. I sort of wait all day for our gab fest, Miss Callahan. I believe we're sweet on each other. You know, you might have been my son, Don, if I'd been lucky enough to have a son. You're much too young to have a 12-year-old son like me. I don't remember my mother or my pop either. You you lived with an aunt before you came here, didn't you? Uh-huh. Hmm. And me has five kids of her own. She's been counting years until I was 16 so I could get a job. And now that I'm without legs, I suppose Aunt May won't want me back. I'll be hard to take care of. She'll have to wait on me hand and foot until I get used to the artificial legs. If I ever get used to them. I've been thinking about it lots. Oh, well, don't think about it too much, Don. Just let things drift. It isn't hard to let things drift during the day, Miss Callan, but when night comes, there are places, aren't there, Miss Callahan, where they send boys like me? Well, yes, there are homes. Charity homes, where the relatives don't have to pay. <laughs> Aunt May was here a while ago during visiting hours. Did she say anything to upset you? Not especially. She just said what I already knew. I, I don't blame her. She has her own kids. It's it's only right that they should come first. I'd just be a drain. Oh, don't talk about being a drain. I brought you a couple of books, Don. 
Oh, gee, thanks. Mm -hmm. And I talked to the lady down at the gift shop on the main floor. She's got a sample radio, and she'll lend it to you gladly. Oh, everyone's so nice in this hospital. Oh, I hate to leave, Miss Callahan. Oh, that's a great recommendation, Don. Well, I know what's what here. I, I know what isn't what. But when I leave the hospital, I, I won't know for nothing. I guess that happens to most boys, though, when they get to be crippled all of a sudden without any warning. In just a moment, Hope Winslow will be back again. But first, French is certainly a romantic language. Can you translate this French phrase? Vous serez récompensé. It means you will be rewarded. Now, you may not be stationed where French is spoken, but no matter where you are overseas, you can be sure that you will be rewarded in many ways if you make the effort to learn the language of the country where you are. While overseas, you are a guest of the country in which you're stationed, and therefore have an obligation to the people. You should act in the same way you would expect someone to act who is visiting your country. Friendship is a valuable thing between people and nations. You can make many new friends and help the cause of understanding between the United States and other countries if you learn the language. A new language can be fun, too. So give yourself a break. Yes, you will be rewarded if you learn the language. Back to our story with Hope Winslow. After scores of x-rays and consultations and blood transfusions, Don's legs had been amputated. There was a fund in the hospital for needy accident cases. The surgeon had wangled it so that Don was temporary beneficiary. And during the long days and weeks, he'd become the hospital's pet and Anna Callahan's obsession. She was so preoccupied the next morning that she didn't see her across the hall neighbor emerging from his flat as she emerged from hers. Is anything wrong, Miss Callahan? I spoke and you didn't seem to hear me. Oh, well, I, I, I didn't see you, Mr. Borden. My mind was... On your job. Yes? Uh, on one phase of my job. The janitor tells me you work in a hospital. Yes, I do. I'm superintendent of nurses. That must be dreary work for a feminine woman like you. I uh, wouldn't have called you a feminine woman last night, or last week, or last month. But this morning, there's something disarming about you. My car is downstairs at the curb. May I drop you at the hospital? Why, you... Uh... I know, I know. You usually take a bus. I also know from experience that the buses are usually crowded at this hour. Don't bite off your nose to spite your face, Miss Callahan. You're a persistent person, Mr. Borden. Ever since you moved in across the hall from me, I've had a great desire to be persistent. Driving you to the hospital is the first progress I've made in my uh, very carefully planned campaign. Oh, I didn't say you could drive me to the hospital. But I may, may I? There now, you see, you're smiling. First time you've ever smiled at me. They went down together in the self-service elevator. They crossed the pavement and Reed Borden unlocked the door of his car, helped Anna into it, climbed in himself. He threw the car into gear and then they were worming their way through the 8.30 traffic. You know, you said something a moment ago that intrigued me. Yes? You said that your mind was on one phase of your job. And when you said one phase, your face softened as if by magic. May I be the inquiring reporter, ask you what you were thinking about when you stood in the hall as if you were a sleepwalker, 
Didn't quite know how you got there. Last night and again this morning. There's a boy in the hospital. His name's Don. Yes? He's just a little over 12. And all of his life is behind him. Why behind him? It's hard for a kid to get along without his legs. Without his legs? A double amputee? Yes. If only he'd grown up to be a soldier, he, he'd have gotten a DSC. But he lost his leg saving a smaller child. The youngster was playing in a crowded street, and a truck came roaring around the corner, and Don made a flying tackle and grabbed the youngster around the legs and threw it at the side. Was the amputation a must? Yes, it was. Our chief of staff himself performed the operation. That's the most I can say. Well... Don's parents will have to make it up to him in some way. In, in every way. He hasn't any. Oh, that's tough. He can't remember his mother or his father. He was brought up by an aunt. Well, if she's brought him up, she must be very fond of him, so she... She has children of her own. She was looking forward to the time when Don would be a wage earner. When he'd contribute to the family income. She doesn't want him now that he's incapacitated. Why the... What a monster. No, no, not a monster. Just a harassed woman, Mr. Borden. There are many such. But Don understands the situation. He knows that his Aunt May's own children must come first. Then you've discussed the situation with him, huh? Yes. Yesterday afternoon he was talking about charity homes that take care of crippled boys. It broke my heart to think of him going to a home. <sighs> I guess we'd better change the subject. I'm getting too emotional. A woman who works in a hospital as hard as you do shouldn't be so sensitive. Your heart must be broken at least 50 times a day. No one's ever affected me the way Don does, Mr. Borden. I'll, uh, I'll get out at the next corner. You look upset yourself, Mr. Borden. And you don't even know the boy. Double amputee. I'll, uh, I'll tell you why I'm upset one of these days. Oh, is there anything I can do for Don? Well, yes, there's one thing you can do. He looks forward to seeing me every day, but tomorrow's my day off and he'll have a long, lonely afternoon with nothing to look forward to. I, I know it's asking a lot, Mr. Borden, but if you could drop in tomorrow at some time during the afternoon and if just... If I could... I can and I will. Give me his full name, Miss Callahan, and his room number. I'll put it in your mailbox tonight. All right, I'll look for it. And here's your corner. Worse luck. Anna Callahan had her usual gab with Don that afternoon. She told him that a man was going to call on him tomorrow as her proxy. And she was glad that his face didn't brighten at the thought of a stranger. Glad that he wanted her. She went home, leaving Don's complete name and room number in Reed Borden's mailbox. She prepared a sketchy meal and went to bed surrounded by magazines. But the stories she read made very little sense to her. It was well past midnight when inspiration struck. Holding her heart, she spoke aloud in the stillness. Oh, I was stupid not to think of it before. Oh, it's been in the back of my brain for ages, but, but it never came clear until this instant. Oh, why have I wasted so much time? The next morning, she went downtown, but not to the hospital. To her lawyer, David Creighton, an old friend. He greeted her in a genial fashion. Oh, good to see you, Anna. Oh, it's good to see you, Dave. You're looking very well this morning. Pink cheek, dewy-eyed, all the rest of it. Nobody take you for a tough superintendent of nurses. Oh, well, that's a great compliment, Dave. <laughs> it was meant to be. Now, what's your problem? Well, now, how do you know I have a problem? If you hadn't a problem, you wouldn't be here. Oh, touche, David. Oh, out with it. 
You're a busy woman, I'm a busy man. I know, and I won't take up any more of your time than necessary. You see, Dave, I, I want to ask you a few questions about legal procedure. I'm all ears. But I hope you haven't gotten yourself into some sort of a jam, my dear. Well, I haven't yet. But I may before I'm through. David, I want to adopt a boy. In just a moment, Hope Winslow will be back. Suppose for a moment that instead of being one of today's men and women in uniform, you were to go back a hundred years and become Billy Yank or Johnny Reb. How was military life during the Civil War? What about pay, for example? Well, it wasn't very much a hundred years ago. Yankee privates received only $13 a month during most of the war. Privates in the Confederate Army received only $11 for a month soldiering. Worse yet, payments were often late, sometimes by as much as six months. Today's servicemen and women are, of course, properly paid for their efforts. What's more, the payments come on time. Yes, there can be a lot of improvements in a hundred years. Today's soldier, sailor, or airman has a far more favorable pay situation than he would have had in the days of Billy Yank or Johnny Reb. To our story with Hope Winslow. David Creighton's bushy eyebrows rose as she stared into Anna Callahan's face. She felt herself blushing. Why, she didn't know. She waited until the bushy eyebrows had come down to their normal position, and then... Well, you heard me, David. Why, I thought I heard you, but then I decided I couldn't believe my ears. When did you get the idea of adopting a boy, Anna? Well, it's quite a long story, but I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. When did I get the idea? Mm -hmm. It only came to me last night, David. I was lying in bed trying to puzzle things out, and suddenly I had an answer. Well, is it a young boy? I mean, a little kid? Or, or is it an infant you want to adopt? But Don's 12. But, well, good heavens, Anna... How would you handle a boy as old as that? Twelve's a difficult age, believe me. I, I have a daughter who's only 15, and she's a mystery to all of us. And a 12-year-old boy can be... Well, he can be a real hellion. Some kids, not much older than he, run with gangs. And... John won't be running with any gangs, Dave. He won't be running at all. Well, what do you mean by that? He lost both his legs in a street accident. Well, he needs me very badly, Dave. His father and mother are dead, and he loves me, and I love him, so it's just perfect. Well, that's what you think. When did you meet up with this kid? In the hospital, I suppose. That's right. Anna, don't you know anything about the adoption laws? Well, not a thing, Dave. That's why I'm here. Well, of, of course, I know that the courts have to approve any adoption. And I know there must be financial security and spiritual security. And I know that I must be able to give him an education. And I must prove he'll never be a public charge. And There must be more than that, my dear. There must be two parents. What? An unmarried woman cannot adopt a child. Neither, for that matter, can an unmarried man. Sorry, Anna, I didn't mean to upset you. You didn't mean to upset me? That's a, a ghastly understatement, Dave. Oh, come now, maybe this is just an impulse, a, a passing fancy. Oh, no, Dave, I'm not the sort of woman who has whims. You should know that. Well, you've never had them before, but there's always got to be a first time. Your eyes are filling with tears, Anna. I I'm sorry. I, I wish there was something I could do. Anna Callahan wandered home desolately. By the time she'd reached her apartment, she felt as if she'd never cry again. She'd suppressed the tears too long. She lay on her bed staring at the ceiling, and hours passed. 
Suddenly there was a knock on the door and she struggled up, brushed her hair back from her forehead and went to open the door. Hello there, Miss Callahan. Uh, look, I I'm in a fix. I, I thought that perhaps you could give me a suggestion of sorts or... Great Scott, Miss Callahan, what in heaven's name have you been doing to yourself? Anna Callahan, superintendent of nurses, stood staring at her across the hall neighbor. And then she moved silently aside and he came into the foyer and she shut the door after him. She led the way into the living room and when they were seated opposite each other. I've been looking forward to calling on you for a long while, Miss Callahan, but now, well, the edge has kind of gone off the victory, if it is a victory. I'm so mad I could bite the heads off tax, and of course it's lousy for the kid, too. The kid? Don. I thought about him all last night, Miss Callahan, when you told me about that double amputation. It, it just hit me right between the eyes. You see, my kid brother lost his legs somewhere in Korea. They did a beautiful amputation. It was a success. But the patient didn't live. It was around midnight, I guess, when I decided to adopt Don. When you decided to adopt Don? Yes. If we talk to each other, of course. Well, Don and I talk to each other, all right. And I sort of hinted what I had in mind. And then when I left him, I went directly to my lawyer. And the lawyer pointed out that you were unmarried. Now, how in the name of common sense... <gasps> Thought waves must have been running back and forth across the hall between our apartments around midnight, Mr. Borden. I had the same idea about Don. That I'd adopt him, I mean. I saw my lawyer this morning, and he told me precisely what your lawyer told you, and... You're staring at me that way. Can't you guess why I kept wanting to know you? Though you gave me brush off after brush off? Can't you guess why I've been trying to intrude on your privacy? The first time I saw you, I thought, she's for me. Will you marry me, Anna? You must want Don very badly. I want him badly. Not half as badly as I want you. When you get to know me, Anna, you may like me very much. I, I've been told that I grow on people. And... Anna, you're blushing. That's a good sign, isn't it? to a home and happiness. Maybe he won't miss two legs so much now that he's going to have two parents. When Anna Callahan went to see her lawyer and friend, David Creighton, he told her that he had a 15-year-old daughter who was a mystery to the whole family. David Creighton, a fine lawyer who wasn't clever enough to analyze or solve a family problem. Until then, this is Hope Winslow saying goodbye from the Whispering Streets. Today's program was written by Margaret E. Sangster. Featured in the cast was Kathy Lewis as Hope Winslow. Others in today's story were Barbara Eiler, Olin Soleil, Dick Beals, and Vic Perrin. Whispering Streets was directed by Gordon T. Hughes and produced by Ted Lloyd. Your announcer is Dan Coverley. Whispering Streets, 
has come to you through the worldwide facilities of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.